All right. Well, everybody, thanks for being here today. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Alex Stubbs. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Applied Ethics Center here at UMass Boston and um, the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. Um, and we're very happy to have Sarah Jaffe here to speak with us today um, as part of our lecture series on technology and the future of work. Um, Sarah is the author of Work Won't Love You Back, How Devotion to Our Jobs Keeps Us Exploited, Exhausted, and Alone, and also Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, both from Bold Type Books. She is a Type Media Center reporting fellow and an independent journalist covering the politics of power from the workplace to the streets. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, The Guardian, The Washington Post, the New Republic, The Atlantic, and many other publications. Um, she's also the co-host um, of Descent Magazine's Belabored Podcast, as well as a columnist at the Progressive and New Labor Forum. And her talk today is entitled, Will We Love Our Jobs in the Future? Uh, the Labor of Love and the Future of Work. So we're very happy to have you with us here today, Sarah, and the spotlight is yours. All right, hi, um, it is... 11 a.m. where I am. I'm in New Orleans, so um, I'm still sort of waking up, um, but I hope you will all bear with me. Um, as Alex was saying, I'm Sarah. I wrote this book about loving your jobs and why it's a bad idea, and yet we all do it anyway. <laughs> and um, I'm, yeah, happy to be here. I feel like I've had a lot of conversations about the, the future of work. And I have like another invitation to give another one of these in my inbox. And I'm kind of like, I think, I often think the future of work discourse is, is sort of missing something, right? Um, I think we treat work or jobs as something that people really want to do. And therefore we really need to figure out what the future of them might look like because we'll be very sad if we don't have jobs. Um, that this is a way that we get meaning in our lives. But of course, um, the story that I tell in Work Won't Love You Back is that that idea is itself a relatively recent development over the horse, course of the history of capitalism. And that by sort of tracing the development of this idea, the way it spread from a couple of places to the entire workforce, um, that itself is, is a reminder that these are not sort of eternal expectations um, and ideologies of the workplace, that these are things that can change. And sometimes they change very quickly. Um, I have a story that I like to tell that um, the first couple of months after the book came out, I was doing a talk with Dave Zirin, who is a wonderful um, left-wing sports journalist, good friend, um, and generally a fun person to hang out with. and was a fun person to talk about this book with because of course I write a chapter about sports. But before we were doing the talk, Dave sent me an article from a Tampa Bay newspaper. I forget which one, because back in the day people, you know, there were more than one big newspaper in a big city um, talking about workaholism being a new problem. And it was describing all of the expectations that now you just find in your average um, job want ad, right? Help wanted, uh, extremely dedicated person who has no life and will work 24 seven and blah, 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 and do that all for $10 an hour. Um, and this article, which was from 1982, so it was two years younger than I am, um, was saying this as though this was a problem, that this was a new issue that people were having, that their spouses, their friends, their um, kids, parents, whoever, were workaholics now. And so again, this is, this is in my lifetime um, that this was a problem. And now it's just the expectation to the point where during the relatively early days of COVID, we had the Lieutenant Governor of Texas saying that people would happily die to get the economy reopened, specifically older people like him, he said. Um, I noticed that he was not volunteering to go work on the line at a restaurant or um, be a you know janitor in a hospital treating COVID patients. But nonetheless, you know, other people should do that and die so that the economy can keep going. Um, so we have, as I think those two points succinctly note, um, a really screwed up relationship to work right now. Um, and yet at the same time, I think that the entire history of capitalism is showing that like work is always coercive, work is always more or less unpleasant, and it is something that we would not do if we did not have to. Um, so when we talk about the future of work, 
we're talking about the future of capitalism and particularly we're talking about the future that is determined by the outcomes of struggles that are happening right now and that have been happening over the last 500 years or so. Um, so I wanted to stress from the start, I guess I've been talking for a few minutes now, that the idea that we should love our jobs and take meaning from them is the result of a series of historic defeats of working people. So wage labor itself is something that came about because um, essentially wealthy people enclosed all the land, kicked people off of it and required them to work in order to buy the things that they used to be able to provide for themselves in different ways. Um, there are also a series of incredibly restrictive poor laws that determined if you could not work, legitimately could not work, um, and therefore could get some sort of aid, or if you would be punished by essentially being left to starve to death if you refused to go get a job. The early conditions of um, the early days of industrial capitalism were dominated by conditions that Friedrich Engels referred to as social murder. Um, because they were set up in a variety of ways not to sustain human life, but actually to just, you know, let people die. Um, people did not wake up one day and decide that they would have more meaningful lives inside the dark satanic mills of Manchester or the mines of Wales. They were forced there and they were brutally repressed when they rebelled. So fast forward through hundreds of years of struggles, strikes, um, massacres, other fun things, the mine wars, lots of things you can ask me about later if you want to, um, to the era that we now hear about through mostly a million nostalgic hot takes, which is the mid-century brief period of union strength, wages that actually went up as companies made more money, the weekend, decent health care, sort of, um, and all of the things that have been systematically dismantled over the course of basically my lifetime. And once again, just for notes, I was born in 1980. So I am not quite the same age as neoliberalism, but um, <laughs> I was born just before Reagan took office. Um, so neoliberalism also didn't just happen, right? It was a set of choices made by the winning side in another series of struggles. And the people who won that, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, et cetera, remade the state to subject everything to competition, to enforce private property rights, to protect the right of individuals like now Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos to accumulate insane amounts of money to spend on very silly things like not really space flights. Um, public services were sold off to private profiteers, which led to um, a lovely private train system that, you know, has just derailed. I mean, there have been quite a few derailments in the last few weeks, and that's somewhat normal. We're only hearing about it more because one of those derailments was so bad that we had it created a cloud from the burn off of chemicals that could be seen from airplanes flying overhead. Talking, of course, about East Palestine, Ohio, where we do not know exactly what the conditions are going to be for people going forward because um, a lot of the testing that's been done has been done, paid for by the rail company. So do people trust them? I don't. Um, so right, so citizens become customers, freedom is there, you just have to pay for it. And let me not talk about my health insurance. Um, so this economic and political crisis of the 1970s that began the process of deindustrialization, um, which then was done intentionally, um, production is shut down in rich countries like this one and shipped elsewhere or automated or both. Um, and you see workers like auto workers, coal miners, et cetera, who used to be able to go on strike to halt production in order to get their demands met, suddenly can't really do that anymore, right? If the company wants to close it down anyway, going on strike to keep it open doesn't have the same amount of leverage. So suddenly these workers are put in the position of um, calling for these places to be kept open with, again, limited leverage. So Joshua Clover in his book, Riot Strike Riot, refers to this as the affirmation trap, which is a situation where labor is locked into the position of affirming its own exploitation under the guise of survival. And so it's a very short step from the affirmation trap to the labor of love. The jobs that replace these factory jobs, if they were replaced, which in many places they were not, um, are in retail, in healthcare, services, and technology. We hear a lot about the knowledge economy. We're all sitting here on Zoom right now. This is very exciting. Um, but in reality, most people are far more likely to be in some sort of service work. And these jobs come with their own affirmation trap, 
you must show up and smile or you lose your job. So the ideals of freedom and choice that all of this was supposedly in the name of um, mostly function as a mechanism for justifying inequality. The choice is yours, but so are the costs for choosing wrong. And all of the cuts to the welfare state mean that those costs are often deadly. This kind of freedom, as political theorist Adam Kotzko wrote, is also a trap. It's an apparatus for generating blameworthiness. But you know, it's fine, right? Today's workers are all cheery and we're happy and we're flexible and networked and creative and we're caring. We love our jobs, but we hop from job to job like serial monogamists. Our hours get extra long. The line between the home and the workplace, in this case, I'm in someone else's home, but you know, um, blurs. Security, which used to be the sort of backbone of the industrial bargain, the Fordist bargain, if we want to call it that, where workers spent a lifetime at one job and earned a pension on their way out the door, has been traded in theory for fulfillment. And the things that we used to keep for ourselves, indeed the things that the industrial workplace wanted to minimize in people, are suddenly in demand on the job, including our friendships, our feelings, and our love. So this labor of love discourse, um, it is, again, relatively recent, and it is a form of common sense of the neoliberal era. If we don't really need as many people to work as we used to, but capitalism requires we work in order to be able to pay the rent, keep a roof over our heads, and feed the dog, um, we have a sort of paradox, right? So the labor of love helps to fill in that gap, motivating us to commit more fully to work at the same time as those working conditions are getting worse for, I mean, frankly, after COVID, pretty much all of us, unless you're Jeff Bezos. Um, and inequality, again, is growing. And this discourse is applied to all kinds of work. Um, I talk a lot about an Amazon warehouse job ad that I used to see along the New Jersey Turnpike when I lived in Philadelphia. Um, and it was a big old billboard and it said, get a job delivering smiles. Now you've all probably heard some of the stories about Amazon warehouse work and what it's actually like, but it involves very little smiling as far as I can tell. Um, and this, again, I don't think that if you were looking for a job in a coal mine in West Virginia in 1955, that the ad would be get a job delivering smiles. Um, it might have been get a job delivering power as in electricity, but I digress. So the certain sectors where the labor of love discourse was more or less embedded from the start are basically caring work and creative work, which we will get into in a little bit. Um, but it's also shaped by the world outside the workplace, which is, again, a world where housing is more expensive, education is much more expensive, um, healthcare, oof. Um, policing is growing harsher, people have more care responsibilities in the private home, where immigration is, um, immigration enforcement rather, is getting nastier and more brutal, and even supposed liberals are saying we want to ban all refugees into the country. And then, you know, again, COVID, which I hope to not talk too much about, but we'll probably come back to it a little bit. Um, where new technologies allow employers to slice and dice schedules, to demand that office staffers are working from home at all hours, log your keystrokes on your computer, supervise app-based workers in a variety of ways, um, and so on and so forth. And so while a lot of the different workers that I have named and am going to name might not appear at first to have too much in common, this labor of love myth unites broad sectors of the economy at this point. Both home healthcare workers and video game programmers have told me about hearing about how their workplace is a family. Um, so we don't have too many people live on this call, so it's not as much fun to do this show of hands, like who's been told their workplace is a family? But I have quite a few times in both restaurants and journalism, I should add. Um, and actually less so when I actually worked for my family, but again. Um, so, the same way that COVID affected how people feel about work, the shift towards the labor of love, towards this idea and um, compulsion, in fact, to love our jobs came about through these changes in the actual economy. Industrial jobs go away. The jobs that take their place require more emotional input from you. 
um, the fields that are growing the fastest, that are adding the most jobs, are things like nursing, food service, and home health care, which are all gendered jobs where the worker is expected to care for other people and put their emotions on hold in order to make sure that the people they are deep working for um, are happy, satisfied, cared for, et cetera. These kinds of service positions draw on the skills that are presumed to come naturally to women. They are seen as extensions of the caring work that we are expected to be naturally good at and do for our families without pay. On the other side of the job growth list are computer programmers who probably earn higher salaries than your average home health aide, although that is um, probably going to change with the round of tech layoffs that we're seeing right now. Um, especially, I was just looking at something this morning about how um, Amazon is now talking about rehiring the people that they just laid off. So uh, why would you want to do that, I wonder? <laughs> Could it be to try to pay them less the next time around? But even those programmers are expected to demonstrate passion for their work, though they're more often expected to show that passion through long hours rather than in emoting at the screen. Um, but that work is closer to the jobs of other creative types or people like me um, doing journalism that are rooted in our old notions of artistic work and who does that work and how and for what reasons. So, um, want to note too at this point that it's not all coercion right in a way or it is coercion but it's a different kind of coercion as well um in a way this shift towards the labor of love was responding to the demands that workers are making they're just not exactly giving us really what we wanted um so luke boltanski and eve Chapello in their book the new spirit of capitalism which was written over the 1990s i should note um they argue that capitalism has changed in response to the struggles of its critics um, and at that point, they're mostly talking about the social movements of the 60s and 70s because they were writing before the most recent wave of movements that we've seen in the last decade or so. So they identify two critiques, the artistic critique, which challenged the conformity of mid-century capitalism, basically decrying its fundamental boringness as oppressive, right? Spending 50 years down the coal mine if you live long enough or the same amount of time at a desk in a gray flannel suit um, that those things are oppressive and people actually want jobs that they can get more pleasure and stimulation out of. And then there's the social critique, right? Which is the thing we're probably more or less expecting, right? Fo focuses on fundamental inequalities, um, the way that a few people get to have a rocket that doesn't really go to space and the rest of us face what geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls organized abandonment. Um, and so the movements of that time, just as a refresher, right, are talking about all sorts of things that are often um, somewhat derisively called identity politics, right? But we're talking about racial justice, we're talking about um, feminism, we're talking about the gay rights movement, and we're also talking about a new and more radical and more democratically oriented shift in the labor movement. And this is something that was happening from Lordstown, Ohio, to the Fiat factory in Torino in Italy. Um, this rebellion against, again, the boringness and misery of the Fordist factory, even if you did have a decent salary and a vacation and could buy a, ho a house and send your kid to college so that they could, for God's sake, get out of the factory. Um, you saw wildcat strikes in places like Lordstown where workers were protesting not just the speed up, but in general control over the mode and means of production. So all of this, right, is uh, raising some hell. And then there's a squeeze on profits, um, in part due to an oil crisis, in part because, well, capitalists don't actually like giving you um, what your work is worth, because that's where the profits come from. And so we get um, the remaking of the world that started in 1973 or so. But so the process of outsourcing or automating these jobs that people were complaining about um, and pushing people into service work, care work, um, if you're lucky, creative work, um, or just the cliche of telling coal miners to learn to code, um, it's resulted in, again, employers seeking out these human traits that those workers were in some, on some level, like asking for the recognition of, right? except what we actually get um, is, you know, they're supposed to make work less miserable, but actually they've just helped work take over every facet of our lives because they came sort of, here's the gift of you get to be a person at work. 
and here's the takeaway, but your union's gone now. <laughs> and uh, you love your job, right? So you won't mind working overtime. We don't have to pay you for that. So a little bit more about the two sides of this story to just say that um, the caring work, the first half of my book is based in this narrative that starts with unpaid work in the home, paid domestic work, um, retail, restaurants could also go in here, teaching, nursing could also go in here and the nonprofit sector. Um, and then the other half was creative work and that starts of course with the arts. Um, I write about unpaid internships, which have crept from the creative industries into all sorts of, again, actually what they really started out in medicine, but um, they became really popular in the creative industries and then spread like a cancer across uh, all sorts of industries. I write about academia, which I'm sure uh, many of you have opinions about. I write about computer programming. Specifically, I talk with video games programmers. And then I wrote a chapter about sports to wrap it all up. So all of these things, again, this is a, a broad spectrum of workplaces that we could talk about, and I'm sure we will talk about some of them more, but the pressures in all of them are towards, again, if you don't love it, you better pretend that you do. So work's getting worse for everyone, yay. Um, I wanna talk a little bit before I wrap up about what COVID has done to our experience of work. Um, because from the beginning, what happened was we were kind of split into three groups, right? There were those of us like me, like, you know, we're all sitting here on Zoom, um, who could basically keep doing what we had been doing before, but do it from home. So that makes it more complicated and messy in a variety of ways. I have to warn you that this dog might come in here barking at some point. Um, I have to turn a corner of my apartment into an office. I was working from home beforehand, so I may be a bad example of this. But um, the blurring of boundaries between work and home become really messy and unpleasant. Um, and especially if you have children that you are also trying to take care of now while doing your day job, that's just a whole mess. Um, the second group is people who just got laid off, right? And in the States, we dealt with this through the unemployment system. So in other countries, they had some sort of furlough program. So you could lay people off, you could like not lay people off and the government would fund their salaries so that people could keep people attached to jobs. In this country, we just said fire them all. Um, the spike of the jobs numbers that week was really fascinating. And we expanded unemployment. And then there are the people who kept doing their same jobs in much more dangerous conditions, whether you're working in a hospital actually caring for people who had COVID or working in a grocery store or in a warehouse. Um, these are the so-called essential workers, right? That we thanked for a while. And it is not an accident that these are the essential workers who have been going on strike for much of the last few years. Um, so as noted for pretty much everyone, again, unless you are just rolling in the extra profits that certain companies were making in this moment, um, your conditions got worse. And also this sort of underscored the importance and the power that workers have in the economy. So we're talking about how essential people are all of a sudden, right? We're realizing that if people get sick doing this job, we're all in trouble. Um, and you saw things like companies briefly giving bonus pay. Um, I covered a story where workers at Kroger were getting $2 an hour extra hazard pay for the first few months of the pandemic. Then their hazard pay gets rolled back. And then actually some of those workers got letters in the mail telling them they had been overpaid their hazard pay and they would actually have to pay back their overpayment. Um, and after a few of us broke that story, Kroger was embarrassed enough to not make them pay back their having been overpaid for risking their lives. Um, so, and again, things that I can talk about for approximately forever if we, um, anybody has questions about the various different industries and people's experiences during COVID. But the broad thing that I've been tracking in this um, over this period of time is how that has changed people's opinions of their employers, um, how many times people who were supposedly essential workers told me that what they thought essential actually meant was expendable, um, how workers who might have assumed that they were middle class suddenly realized that, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, your boss doesn't care if you die. 
Um, and that's a thing that, you know, even I would have said slightly hyperbolically before COVID, but then we realized exactly how true it is. And I think this train derailment, again, is another good example of the fact that, like, the company doesn't really care what happens to the workers on that train. Um, and it also doesn't really care about what happens to the community that the train runs through, um, which is a good reminder that we are all connected once again. But so we've seen workers who might have been going along with the flow more or less pre-COVID are now refusing in a few key ways. One of them is this thing that was called the great resignation, right? People are quitting their jobs. They're trying to find another one. They're waiting, taking advantage of um, finally a sustainable level of unemployment money to actually try to find a job that might not treat them like utter garbage. Um, a lot of people switched industries, right? A lot of people who had maybe been working in customer facing um, service work decide that it's suddenly not worth it. I spoke to a Sephora worker at the makeup chain for those who are not um, compulsive makeup buyers like me, who, you know, before the pandemic said, this was a, you know, it was a pretty good job. I made $15 an hour. Um, I got to put makeup on people. The customers were mostly nice. It was like a fine job. But after COVID, she just said, I'm not going to die for lipstick. And I think that's a really powerful explanation of, of what happened in some of these industries. We're obviously seeing waves of joining or forming a union. Um, the Starbucks workers and the Amazon workers sort of grab the headlines, but there's also been a wave at places like art museums and grad students. Um, there have been waves in grocery stores and other fast food chains. So again, a lot of the essential workers. And then of course, if they're already unionized or sometimes even if they're not already unionized, um, people are going on strike. So we saw, we've seen university strikes. My former union at Temple University where I was a grad worker from 2007 to 2009 is on strike still um, there, but also the John Deere factory workers, um, Nabisco and Frito-Lay. So again, essential work, um, various restaurants, fast food, um, we've seen a really big wave of nursing and hospital strikes. And um, what am I forgetting? There's one more I forgot. In any case, there are plenty of them. Um, and so this, these sort of connected and yet not always immediately connected in reality, um, forms of dissent and expressions of the different kinds of power that workers have, um, are, you know, freaking out bosses. And so we're seeing, and we have seen, right, state legislatures doing everything from lowering child labor laws. Thank you, Arkansas. Now children as young as nine can get a job without a work permit. Thanks, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Um, to <laughs> basically just cutting off unemployment and forcing people to get jobs. Um, and we won't talk about the student loan situation yet. But that said, um, as I wrap up here, um, I am actually kind of hopeful because I think that what's happening here is the end of the labor of love ideology as a functional tool to beat people into working. Um, I think that that is just not going to hold up to the COVID moment. And I also think that, I mean, obviously I wrote this book at a particular time because I was observing a phenomenon in the reporting that I was doing, right? I didn't just decide like, I hate work and therefore this is a thing. Um, my job is to talk to workers. And so that's what happens. Um, I think that if this book had come out five years before, um, nobody would have cared. People would have just been like, you're crazy. Um, so I actually think that's great, not just for me, but because it actually lays the groundwork for more rebellion, more struggle. Um, that is going to be the thing again, that shapes the future of work. Um, so I sort of want to close on this idea of what would the future of work be if rather than organizing an economy around capitalist profit, we considered, really considered what is the essential work that needs to be done to actually have a functioning society where people are happy um, and cared for to the degree that they actually need to be, um, not just what we can pay for. And I think by tracing this history of the idea of loving our jobs, we get a clearer picture about what we should be thinking about when we talk about the future. Um, what priorities workers might actually have and not just 
um, the sort of people who are trying to create workplace happiness surveys and why the future depends on these struggles that workers are making right now in and also outside of the job site, right? I think housing fights, I think the fight over student loan forgiveness, um, fight against policing, the fight against Cop City in Atlanta, all of these things are also going to affect the future of work. Um, so I think it's really exciting that we're talking about things like a four day working week, the four day week trial that just wrapped up, um, got really great results, um, things like basic income, all of that. But in general, the thing that I always want to talk about is how do we shift our focus away from the idea that we work because it gives us meaning and think that like we work because that is what allows us to live, but what if we thought about it an entirely different way? How would we distribute work differently if we understood that some of the, the jobs that need to be done, some of that absolutely essential work is not going to be pleasant, right? Hospitals need to be cleaned. Trash needs to be picked up. Toilets need to be cleaned. None of that's fun to do. I've done a good bit of it. I've never been a hospital janitor, but I've definitely uh, picked up a lot of garbage in my working life. Um, but it needs to be done. So how do, we dis how do we distribute that differently? So rather than having a certain subset of people whose job it is to pick up the trash, um, we're all doing some trash picking up. It won't kill us. Um, it actually kills a lot of sanitation workers. It's approximately twice as dangerous to be a sanitation worker as it is to be a police officer, just for a random bit of information that lives rent free in my brain. But yeah, and I think, again, the point that I, you know, it's a very simple and yet very obvious one that, um, the future of work is based on who wins these struggles happening right now and whether we decide that we're going to fight to have our priorities be human flourishing or Jeff Bezos's kind of penis shaped rocket. And with Jeff Bezos's rocket, I will conclude and um, let you all ask me any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I, I think we have a small enough group here that we can sort of go as people have those questions, but I'll do my best to moderate. Jay, I think you got your hand up. <clears throat> Sarah, that was great. Um, I think I can anticipate your answer to the first <laughs> part of my question, but um, there is a number, we have multi-decade decline of union membership mm -hmm. um, and there are multiple um, possible solution or possible reasons for this. One is a structural explanation, post-industrialism, gigaf gigafication, precarity, things like that. Um, another is a political explanation, hostile labor legislation, that kind of stuff. And then people in the labor movement have various strategic things. You know, we weren't doing enough of this. We should have done more of that. Mm -hmm. um, which one do you come down on? What's your favorite explanation? And then the follow-up to that is, are there any new forms of collective organizing, uh, collective action that you think are very promising for the current industrial moment? Yeah, I mean, I you will probably not be surprised to hear that my answer is all of the above, right? Um, that there is a real intensification of union busting. There's a whole union busting industry out there now that there wasn't 40 years ago. Um, that, you know, that Ronald Reagan busting the air traffic controllers union um, basically signaled to everybody that it was open season on unions. Um, we've got all sorts of hostile legislation that it continues, right? Um, and also, I've been having this conversation recently with a friend, which is that um, the labor movement in focusing on certain industries where it was already strong and a certain idea of who workers are and where their work is um, left itself incredibly vulnerable when it turned out that you could actually take those industries and move them. Um, so capital flight means that it when the GM workers went on strike a few years ago, right, right before COVID, um, and one of their demands was to try to keep open plants, including Lordstown. Um, I had been to Lordstown to cover the closing of it because it's, again, this, it's this iconic place in labor history where these iconic strikes happened. And when GM decides to shut it down, right, it's a, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a moment. And so one of the demands when the workers went on strike was to try to keep this plant and another one open. And they won some of their demands, but they definitely didn't win those ones. Um, and that's because, again, like this point that Joshua Clover makes so eloquently is that um, it's very hard to strike to keep something open. 
you can strike to close it down. Um, which is why the strikes that we're seeing succeed more often these days are things that you can't move. So teachers, turns out we need those. Um, as the Chicago Teachers Union has become one of the major political forces in urban life right now, and a member of it might be the next mayor of Chicago, let's go Brandon, um, and not the Joe Biden way, <laughs> Brandon Johnson. Um, the, the power that teachers, nurses, um, but also bus drivers, transportation workers, and the rail workers, if they hadn't been crushed by Joe Biden and Congress, um, to actually shut down things that people still need um, and that need to be done here, right? You can't have, you can't take the train that brings the chemicals from Louisiana to Illinois and put it in India. It has to be here. Um, they haven't yet figured, actually, I think one of the things that COVID really did very nicely is remind everybody that actually teaching your kids on Zoom sucks. And therefore everybody's idea to have like 5,000 children in one room being taught by one teacher in a you know central location somewhere on video is not gonna work. You actually, people actually want their kids to be taught by local people in local schools, which means that teachers have power. Um, so on that level, like the strike is still incredibly powerful if you were doing it in places that actually still have strategic leverage. Um, the challenge with something like Amazon or something like Starbucks, right, is that Starbucks can close any one store and it doesn't matter because Starbucks has thousands of them. And even if you've organized, I don't remember what the latest numbers were, but it's over 200 um, Starbucks stores, there's a couple thousand of them in this country, right? There's like three in this city alone. Um, and I'm not in a very big city. So Starbucks can close any one of them. And the worst it's gonna get at this point is a slap on the wrist from the NLRB telling them that it's retaliation, but the NLRB doesn't have any real teeth. Another problem, another structural problem, right? Um, is that labor legislation in this country um, relies on institutions that have been totally defanged and were never given enough power in the first place. Um, Amazon is closing the warehouse in the Twin Cities where some of the first successful Amazon organizing went on, which was um, mostly workers who are Somali immigrants with the Awud Center. Um, and they were the first ones to get Amazon to the bargaining table. And now they're closing that warehouse. Um, and again, Amazon still needs to deliver stuff in the Twin Cities, but they're gonna try to shut down that warehouse and open up different ones in order to break up the power that's been built there. So these are the real challenges of organizing right now, right? Um, another one is that it takes something like two years to get a first contract in a place once it's been, once it's won a union election or gotten voluntary recognition. Um, the contract bargaining process takes forever. And at this point, the average job tenure in this country is something like three and a half years. So if it takes you two years to get your union, or it takes you a year to win the union election and then two years to get your first contract, most people are going to be gone in that time. And again, at Amazon, it's more than 100% turnover every year. And they encourage people out the door. They literally give them quit bonuses. Um, in fact, Amazon has gone through so many workers in some places like the Inland Empire that they're actually running out of people to hire. Um, so, you know, we have this incredibly different looking structure of capitalism right now. Right. So what does it look like to organize under that? In some cases, it kind of looks the same. Right. Organizing teachers probably doesn't look that different now than it did 100 years ago when the Chicago Teachers Union was formed. Right. You still got to talk face to face with people in your school. Um, on the other hand, Uber drivers and delivery riders in Europe right, have done really interesting things with organizing basically on WhatsApp groups um, or Facebook groups um, that you can work on building these sort of informal networks of solidarity and use those to call people out on strike, call people out for actions um, in a way that sort of just bypasses labor law that excludes most of these people anyway. But I think one of the things that, again, it's really important for the labor movement to remember is that like all of the loopholes that it didn't contest enough are the places where capital goes. So misclassified, uh, misclassified workers, right? That's taking advantage of old loopholes that, you know, the labor movement basically was like, eh, who cares? Because we've got the factory. Now that you don't have the factory, it really shows that you never learned how to organize those other kind of workers. Um, so again, this is like a subject we can talk about for a million years. One of the good things that's happening right now is that unions are more popular than ever. And a lot of that comes from people seeing unions taking action. Um, I think a lot about something that Matt Stoller wrote during the Wisconsin uprising in 2011, so 12 years ago, um, saying people might only like unions when they see strikes. 
And I think we have to actually think about the way that like, strike waves are real things. People look at organizing in one place and see like, oh, I can do that now. Um, the amount of people who filed for union elections after the ALU won in Staten Island, even if they haven't won any more yet, um, is an indication that people look at something and go like, oh. And it's long been true that a lot of workers and like a basic majority of American workers said that they would love to have a union if they could have one. And they either think it's illegal um, and a lot of people think that right to work states means you can't have a union at all, um, or it's really, really hard to do, and you get union busted and lo lose your job if you try. So we've got the people who would like to do it. The questions are sort of strategic and um, about power, and I think right now we just are not going to win density at the scale it needs to be by going through an LRB elections. And that's the real unpleasant truth that we have to deal with now. And the success of Starbucks and ALU sort of made people think like, oh, maybe this structure works still. It doesn't, it still doesn't. Not a single one of those Starbucks has a contract yet. Um, so yeah, um, if I had the answers to this, I would be out organizing right now. <laughs> Okay, great. That's, yeah, that's, I want to talk about that more, but we have a lot to talk about. So um, Jared has a question and sp he says, speaking of work, he has a, his baby in the next room that will wake up if he talks. So I'll read the question for Jared. Uh, and it's good to see you, Jared. So on International Women's Day, do you see any connections between DEI discourse and the labor of love ideology? The word belonging is starting to be included in this discourse. So the most up-to-date acronym is DEIB, and I'm finding myself suspicious of this development. And I'll I'll second that suspicion and then let you talk. Yeah, well, you saw by my um, whatever. I, I, I actually didn't know what DEI was. I heard that on a panel like earlier this year, somebody asked like DEI and I was like, what? And it was like diversity, equity, inclusion. Is that what it is? Um, that literally these like acronyms are just like, <laughs> um, one of the really funny things about having written this book is that it ended up on like a couple of like business books of the year lists and like people, reporters call me from like, Bloomberg and the New York Times to ask me about like this or that latest trend in the workplace. So somebody called me recently to interview me about um, the like workplace happiness assessments. And I was like, look, like the best thing you can do for your employees is stop trying to judge how happy they are, right? <laughs> like just stop. Um, yeah, like diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's just like, ugh, and then belonging, like, fuck off. I'm sorry. It <laughs> just like, I have like no patience with this garbage <laughs> because like, what does that actually mean in reality, right? What are they going to give you to ensure your belonging? Um, pizza parties, right? Um, my favorite is um, the company that Kevin, who's the video game programmer that I profiled in the book, worked for. Um, actually, I should check in with Kevin and see if he's still working there. Um, I haven't talked to Kevin in a little while. But the, the company had this whole thing on its website about how every whatever day of the week it was, we have a home-cooked meal. And it's like, no, you don't. You have a professional chef that you're paying to cook a meal. That is the opposite of a home-cooked meal. It is literally a work-cooked meal. You know, but it's this like, ooh, we're going to all get together and it's going to be like being at home. Um, and a bit, which is in the book that I note, um, thanks to a conversation with my friend, Julian Saravo, who's also a workplace researcher, um, was that um, the tech workplace with all of these like things it's offering to give you to ensure that you're happy basically wants to like be your wife um, or it steps in in the space between like things your mom doesn't do for you anymore and things your wife would do for you. Um, and I find that very, very interesting, right? Because we're in a world where um, women work and women work largely because we have to, not just because like we wanted to have wonderful careers, sorry, Gloria Steinem, um, that you don't have a stay at home wife anymore. Your wife probably works. Um, so the company is going to now like wife at you aggressively. Um, and that's not about diversity. Those are often in workplaces that are the opposite of diverse. But like DEIB just sounds like another thing that that same company is going to slap on top of the story, right? To be like, oh, now we're worried about belonging. 
But like in actual fact, I feel like what a lot of these things, especially when we start getting into emotion words like belonging and inclusion um, is more pressure to smile, be happy, um, right? It's, it's more labor of love talk. It's more, how are we going to make sure that you're happy in the workplace? Well, like I'm happiest when I'm not in the workplace, thanks. Um, and my job's pretty good considering, right? I literally opened the book with the words, I love my work. Um, but still, I, given my druthers, I would go take this dog to the park. Um, and like this, this way that these things that are ostensibly designed to improve the workplace actually just end up becoming more demands on workers um, I think it's really important to talk about. So like, are these companies that are talking about diversity actually like going out of their way to like mentor working class people of color into their industry? Or are they seeking out like the one person of color that they've heard of already who works in that industry and that person gets sort of passed around? Um, not that I ever see this happen in journalism, uh, but like, you know, it's, it's, we're not creating pipelines to bring say like young black writers into journalism. We're not, we're absolutely not. Um, we've tried in some cases um, and some of the unions are making these demands actually, but like mostly what's happening is they're going, oh, quick, we have to hire somebody of color. Like, oh, let's go get this person um, to check off our diversity boxes. And then that person, in addition to being the, you know, newest person of color in the workplace who's being treated as a token also gets like a bunch of work piled on them to be the face of our diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. So Tressie McMillan Cottom writes about this, right? The way that like black women in the academy have this triple burden where not only do they have to sort of do the teaching and the research better than everybody else just to prove that they belong, then they're also sort of often emotionally like taking on the work of mentoring other black students. And then they are asked to do all of this work of doing the diversity work. Um, and so it just becomes more friggin' work for most people, right? And so I think there's a real big difference, again, if you look at some of the demands that have been made by places like the New Yorker Magazine's union um, for thinking about hiring and retention and actually um, giving people what they need to succeed, the demands are very different than like what the corporate top-down diversity, we're gonna have a talk by, um, what's her name, the white fragility lady, and then go back to paying you all like crap, um, right? Like it's, it's, it's such contradictory garbage and there's a really nice, you know, diversity industry out there that will talk to you all about diversity and never mention pay. Um, Alan Bravo, who is one of the um, early founders of Nine to Five, which is the Women Office Workers Union, told me about a button that she had. It's like, it's my pay, not my consciousness that needs raising. So yeah, <laughs> that was kind of an aggressive rant. Sorry, y'all. Um, this stuff makes me so mad because it's just like, it's such opportunistic garbage. Well, aggressive rants are answers to questions nonetheless, so we'll take them. Um, <laughs> So I, 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 does anybody else have a question before I ask, but I have a very particular question. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Um, um, so this is kind of shifting gears a little bit. So, you know, what you are critiquing is work under capitalism. And I wanna think a little bit about what a post-capitalist work would look like and sort of how you imagine that. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, in, in your conversations with people, are there very clear and identifiable goods that people associate with work um, that you believe would be goods regardless of the circumstances? So, you know, there's sort of, there's a bunch of different critiques of yeah. work. There's sort of like a distributive critique, which is to say, you know, it's about the distribution of, uh, of resources and that can sort of ameliorate people's concerns. There's a productivist critique where, you know, if we, you know, if, if production is democratically organized, then a lot of the feelings of alienation and exploitation will go away. Then there's an, you know, sort of more of an anti-work critique, which is to say work is fundamentally bad, but it's sort of a necessary evil. So I kind of want to know where do you fall on this? And do you, do you find goods in work at all? Or is it something that we should dramatically reduce to the greatest extent? I mean, I think, you know, we can get really specific. Like I gave a talk with Guy Standing last year sometime and he was like, we really need to distinguish work from labor. And I was like, whatever. Um, most people 
use those terms interchangeably and having a fight about semantics is not the thing, not the hill I'm going to die on. Um, however, one little semantic point is that exploitation and alienation are not feelings, they're material conditions of work. Um, they're material conditions of wage labor under capitalism, if we want to be really specific, right? So um, exploitation is not like, I feel bad because my boss is a jerk. It's my boss pays me less than I make for him, and that's where the profits come from. Um, and alienation is the product of my labor is not something I control or get to keep. Um, so I use my book as the sort of example of this, right? That I don't even have a copy of it right around here, speaking of alienation from the products of my labor. Um, I'm not at my own house, so that's why. Thomas probably has one. Anyway, um, I sign a contract with a company. They give me an advance to write a book, which is basically their gamble on how much money they will make off my book. Um, and the contract is basically set up so that the company, if my book is a success, makes twice as much per book sold as I do. That's just the reality. I don't control um, the cover that gets put on it. I had a big fight and I lost that fight, in fact. And I've grown to love my cover, but you know. Um, I do not control where it gets sold. I do not control how much it gets sold for. Um, I do not control when Amazon decides to go on one of these like Kindle sales and marks it down to $2.99, although I do promote those because like not everybody can afford a $30 book. Um, there's, there's a wealth of ways that I don't control this thing. And where my contract also stipulates things like I have to promote it on my social media for X amount of time, which means unfortunately I can't delete Twitter yet. Um, things like that, right, are, are still controlling this thing that is in many ways the most personal bit of labor you can ever do. Um, so yeah, so these are like real material conditions that are conditioned specifically under capitalism. What would writing a book look like if it was not under conditions of exploitation? Um, that is an interesting question, right? Like um, in my arts chapter and in talks that I've done about this with people like Ben Davis and Molly Crabapple, um, we've talked about the idea that like, I've actually got this wonderful tote bag from this talk I did the other day that says artists are essential workers. Um, and one of the things that I think about a lot with that is that like what we want to fund is the making of art, not get paid through the end commodity, which is how the art market works or the book market works, right? So I don't get paid for my work writing the book. I get a slice of the money it makes, right? Um, I don't get a wage. But I do have a fellowship from the Titan Media Center that actually essentially supports me to do my work and underwrites the fact that um, most publications don't pay you enough to live on. So something like that, this is my very um, individual universal basic income experiment. It gives me the opportunity to do things like write a whole ass book on a relatively low book advance, right? Um, that is funding the production of the thing rather than leaving me to like make a wager on the sale of the commodity. What would it look like to take the commodity out of the thing entirely and just say, we're gonna fund the making of art. Then you run into the question of who gets to be an artist. Um, one of the things that I love, and I write about this in the book too, is that um, the WPA during the Great Depression, it didn't only pay for um, many famous people whose work you've seen to make art, photographs, murals, everything. It also paid for community art centers, for everybody to be able to go make art. And that's the kind of thing that I think about in terms of like actually taking the alienation out of the process, right? Is like, can we actually make it possible for everybody to do this thing um, that we would love to do? Because a lot of what we talk about when we talk about the lovable job is like, oh, I need to work my way up to get into the industry where I will have the lovable job and I no longer have to clean toilets. This is my life, right? I worked in restaurants for 10 years before I got to actually make a living as a journalist. Um, and then that leaves other people cleaning the toilets. And so again, like I think part of thinking about unalienated labor is it does inquire, require thinking about the crappy work, literally. Um, and how we distribute that. Does everybody have a monthly shift cleaning toilets or you know, picking up garbage? Like, How do we divide that work? How do we split up the caring labor? Um, there's a very good book forthcoming actually by a woman named Emily Kenway. Um, it's called Who Cares? And it's about being a family caregiver. And she's, you know, one of the things she's criticizing is this idea that you can just pay for all of the care that everyone needs and that the problems will be solved by 
just throwing money at it and, and hiring more people. And she makes the point that like, you still have to have somebody to like, let the paid carer in um, to do the continuity work of making sure that this person has medication, has whatever. Um, and I think thinking about how that work is unequally distributed, right? And what it would actually look like when care is on some level, you know, dependent on our relationships with each other. Um, I don't have a lot of family. So my, the amount of care that I'm going to be responsible for as I get older is somewhat limited because I've just got one parent left. Um, but it also means that there's not a lot of people around me that are sort of expected to be responsible for me if something happens to me. So how are we distributing care in these situations? Um, not based on how much money people have or how much they can afford or the value that they have within personal relationships, but like the value that we have as people. Um, there are so many questions to answer here that I'm always tempted to just give the marks, um, not writing recipes for the cook shops of the future, but you know, I also love his bit about, uh, what is it like hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon and criticize after dinner. Um, that I think part of why I'm so fascinated with essential work as a jumping off place for this conversation is that it makes us think about what actually needs to be done and what is the stuff that we would do for pleasure were we all given free time. And again, having equal access to free time, what would we do differently? Because mostly when we talk about the universal goods of work, um, people want very different things from the workplace and people expect very different things from the workplace. And those are shaped by conditions. So when I went to Indiana to talk to the workers at the carrier factory um, that sort of Trump had made a really big deal about, right? Um, and I'm asking people like, what are you gonna miss about the factory when it closes? I'm working on this for my new book actually. Um, you know, they would look at me like I had three heads and say, the money. Um, and some of them would say like the union and my friends and go in for a beer at the um, wonderful little dive bar across the street. Um, so beers were like bigger than my head. Um, the perils of being a labor journalist. My job is hard. Um, but you know, like they, they were just like, no, like it didn't give them a lot of existential meaning in the world. Like they were on some level, like proud of what they made, but it wasn't, they didn't deeply identify with it. Um, you know, they were like looking around and on either side of the carrier plant was a Target warehouse and an Amazon warehouse and going, that's where I'm going to be working. And they are going to pay me at least 10 bucks an hour less than I'm making right now. And that's going to mean I can't pay my mortgage. Um, and so like universal goods at work, I mostly think it's like better pay and less work. Otherwise, you know, what I want from a workplace is very different than what some other people want from a workplace. And so I think the solution to that is more freedom not um, trying to develop a, a sort of idea of a future of work based on what a certain group of people say they want or focus groups or whatever that, you know, workplace happiness surveys. Yeah, no, and I think that's really, that's really helpful. I think, um, you know, the, the, the flip side of this too is thinking too about the commodification of our leisure time too, and sort of the ways then also our understanding of leisure then is also shaped too by the fact that leisure really, when we talk about leisure is sort of the end state of consumption, right? Which begins with production and ends with consumption. And so there's also the sort of shaping of our, our leisure in a way that is, is can be warped by certain conditions. So there, there's a- Right. I think dating apps are just the gig economy of work or of dating, right? It's you're literally bringing the conditions of having this freaking gadget in your pocket and it's going off when you have to go do a job, except it's a date. Um, yeah, just the, the myriad ways like are, you know, the, the love creeping into work means that work also creeps into love. Um, Nir, did you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah. Um... Thanks so much, uh, Sarah. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, my question uh, follows up a little bit on Alec, what you just said. Um, so, and it's a little bit half-baked still, I'm trying to uh, figure it out, but um, part of why it's, uh, so part of, um, as, 
as I understand the argument, um, part of what it makes part of what makes it difficult for us to sort of find meaning outside of work is that we are framing the expectation of meaning in work, right? Um, and then I'm kind of wondering if that can also be flipped and that part of what makes it easier to talk about meaningful work is that we don't have the skills or the circumstances to find meaning outside of work, whether mm. because leisure is commodified or, or because of, you know, different kinds of social media addiction or what have you, um, that, you know, it almost becomes an easier target to talk about meaningful work because we still want meaning at some level and are not very good at finding it in other way in other contexts because of both structural and psychological reasons. Yeah, I guess I just don't feel like I have a hard time finding meaning outside of work. Yeah, but um, other people might. I, I guess, but I, I don't actually hear that when I'm doing interviews with people that they're like, oh my God, if I lose this job, I will have no meaning in my life. Um, mostly, you know, I think there is an expectation that is very um, social and political, right? That the answer that, you know, from the time that you're a little kid, we will start asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? That this is really sort of inculcated in us from like a young age. And if you have parents like mine, they'll, they'll start telling you, oh, well, that's not a real job when you're five years old. You're like, I want to be an astronaut. Well, probably not. Well, I want to be a writer. You can't make money doing that. <laughs> you know, that kind of pressure. But like, I think on a more like specific level, like I think one of the things that has, or many of the things that have declined that are the social institutions in which people used to find meaning, right? It's not an accident that when I said to a bunch of the people who were losing their jobs at Carrier and Rexnord, that they said the union is what they would miss, um, is that the decline of unions, but also the decline of church, the decline of things like the Elks Club, right? Like all of these sort of social institutions in which people used to have an identity and fun, um, those have declined, right? Bowling alone and, and all of that right. jazz. I actually read that book. Um, but, did they decline because of work though? Like, I mean, they declined for a lot of reasons. Like in the case of unions, they declined because um, you, the unions got busted. Um, so like I've been doing a lot of, so I'm working on a book about grief. This is the next project. And there's a chapter in it about deindustrialization. And so I'm, I'm sort of looking at this question now of like, what do people miss when the factory goes away? Um, because when you talk to people who work in the factory, the usual answer is the factory sucks, right? Um, that this is um, Ruth Milkman's wonderful book, Farewell to the Factory is a really good look at this. Um, that actually when a lot of people got the chance to get buyouts from, um, this was a factory in Linden, New Jersey, they were happy to take it. Um, and so what are people missing? And in the case of, of so many people, right? A lot of it's the money. Um, it's also an idea of productivity that is embedded in a certain social context. Um, but also it's like literal institutions like the miners union. Um, I sat down with the guy who is the current president um, or general secretary of the National Union of Mine Workers in Britain, right? And he is not an active miner anymore. Most of their members are not active miners anymore because there's like one functioning mine in Great Britain and it's got like 200 employees. And so most of what he does as the president of the union at this point is go to commemorations and talk about um, the contributions that miners made and also like fight for the healthcare and support that the retirees need. Um, and so what people got meaning from in that case was often the community that they built around this, in the case of mining, incredibly dangerous job, right? Like pretty much everyone I've talked to who's worked in or around coal mines has basically compared it to going to war um, because the amount of deaths in the mines were horrendous and they were worse in, in the US because the mines were privatized. Um, in Britain, at least you had like a nationalized system that somewhat valued human life. Um, they built an entire structure where the entire community would basically be built around the mine and the union. Um, the union had bowling leagues and owned the pub and had all sorts of community activities, lunches. I've got a friend who wrote a dissertation on union bowling leagues. Um, so all of these sort of social things that were built around the union, not 
the workplace per se, um, those are gone now and you're left with kind of nothing. Um, and so in most cases, the thing that people are not like missing is the work itself. And this is what I mean about like, when we look at this point in history where these things change, we realize that people have not always, and not everyone does seek meaning in their, seek a deep meaning in their work. Um, they're often making the best of a bad situation. Yeah. So I think to, to look at this and say like, I find meaning in my work, but I'm lucky enough to get to do this for a living. Um, I also do this kind of conversation with my friends at the pub, right? Um, I have an active political life that isn't only my job. And therefore, like, if I could just quit work tomorrow, I would still do a lot of the political stuff that I do, not for money. Um, and I would just be saved the part of this where I have to fill out five things and I've got to write the IRS a check for $20,000 at the end of the year because um, freelance taxes. Um, so I think we've got to think about like the structures that were created to allow people to have meaning um, and fun, just leave yeah. it away, um, that we don't have anymore. Um, yeah. Various places that people took meaning and recognize again that like the idea that we should find work meaningful is a relatively recent development. You know, just a, just a quick follow-up uh, listening to you and especially to the mine war analogy it makes me think that some of the dynamics of meaning in work are analogous to uh, the dynamics of military motivation mm -hmm. where people uh, get drawn in sort of because of some sort of description of the cause mm -hmm. and then patriotism very quickly morphs to relationships with the other people in the unit yeah and then by the time they get home if they feel alienated they feel alienated because they miss their friends rather than because they don't have a cause to die for yeah, very um, much so. Yeah. Um, and particularly with, with the mines, though, it's like when you think about like West Virginia, right? And the places that were really intensely mining communities, right? Just to, to go with an example, because I've just been reading a, a wonderful forthcoming book on this, um, that in these communities, you didn't even go into the mines because you were drawn to the cause. You went into the mines because there was literally no other way to make a living. Um, that's what there was in the community that paid you halfway decently. Um, so you did that and then literally, yes, you found your meaning in making sure that you took care of the guys next to you, Chris Kitchen, um, the guy from the, um, miners union in Britain was saying like, you know, he's like, you might not like each other, but if you see that thing start to wobble and you know, it's coming down, you're going to save his life, whether or not you get along, whether or not you're friends, you know, and that kind of solidarity, that's the thing that's really meaningful. Um, and one of the conversations that I had with, um, oh God, what is his name? Why am I blanking on his name? It was four years ago, that's why. Um, one of the people in Indiana from the Rexnord plant, um, which is around the corner from Carrier, that's why I keep mishing the two of them up. Um, there was another strike going on. The same union that represented the workers at the two plants that were closing also represented workers at this plant um, at a place called Sumco that I think makes chemicals. Um, and they were on strike while I was there. It was like they planned it for me. And you know, so this, this guy who was losing his job at Rexnord was coming down at the end of the day and doing, you know, a couple hours on the picket lines with the guys at Sumco. And he said, like, somebody drove by and sort of yelled out the window, like, they're just going to close you down too. And he was kind of like, you know, I can't imagine what it would be like to just have like nothing in your life that you're willing to stand up for. Right. And it was like, in some ways, the meaning in those people's workplace is this sort of antagonism with the boss. Right, like they're literally taking their meaning, not from the employer, but from standing up against the employer and demanding and winning things from the employer. And yeah, it's a very good point about soldiers being economic draftees or just literal draftees in the not too distant past, right? Like a lot of people are not, um, or right now if we're thinking about like Russia and Ukraine, right? Like a lot of people are fighting either because their community has been invaded, whether they like it or not, or because they're being pushed to do it and don't really have a, another choice well sarah um unless there's any other brief questions we don't want to hold you too long because i know you have to give another talk in the afternoon and you yeah, need to go walk your dog <laughs> <laughs> um so you know i just wanted to thank you very much for for talking with us today it was very illuminating i appreciate yeah, it thanks these are great questions too these are really um thank you so much thank you yeah, for the good work
look yeah. forward to your book on grief. Yeah. Yeah, if I Good survive luck. writing it, that'll be the challenge. Um, thank you so much.